Amen. It's good to pray, isn't it? It's good to pray. It's good to visit with the Lord. It's good to tell Him what's on your heart. It's good to tell Him uh, what's bothering you, what's getting you, what's bugging you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We have been talking about our salvation. We're saved by two incorruptible things. Number one, the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then we've been talking about the, the other uh, part of our salvation, and that is the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. You will always have somebody that does not like your stand on the Bible. You'll always have somebody that's going to question you. You're always going to have somebody that's going to challenge you. And they're going to go after you. They're going to say, what are you saying? I'm not saved because I read this Bible or I, you know, read our, our church uses such and such Bible and so on. And sometimes people are just trying to lead you into a trap. And if you'll just learn to just answer with Scripture, okay, just answer with Scripture. Just say, you know what, let me tell you what I believe. I believe that we're not born again by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. And see, they can't argue again. See, if they're going to argue with that, they're just arguing with God. And then you can just back away slowly and say, I'll let you and God deal with this, all right? I'll let you and God tackle this, all right? But that's what I believe. I believe that we're saved by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Amen. If you want your salvation to be incorruptible then the method of that salvation must be incorruptible. It must be incorruptible blood, and it must be incorruptible seed. So he says um, in verse 23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. And he, he just, he makes it in no uncertain terms. What is the seed? Well, if you study that parable of the seed and the sower, you find out that the seed is the word. And here you find out that it is the Word of God. It's not just words in general, it's the Word of God. And those words live and they abide forever. There is not one word that God has allowed to slip out of what He gave to His servants, the prophets, to Isaiah, to Moses, to Jeremiah, to Matthew to Peter, to James and John, there's not one word that God has allowed to be corrupted or to slip out of His Word. We can be assured by the very statements of the Word of God that the Word of God itself is 100% accurate and that is 100% pure, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 24, For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. We went to Home Depot before church. We's, Lisa likes to go through their lawn and garden section and see what they got on sale. She's not going to buy it unless it's on sale. And they had the awfulest, crummiest, wilted, deadest flowers I've ever seen in my life for sale. Now, if you want to buy stuff like that, if, you wanna, if you're going to buy your wife flowers, don't buy them pre-wilted. Okay? Buy them fresh. Amen. Honey, this is what I think of you right here. Better be right. Amen? The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth in the original manuscripts. That's not what it says. It said it endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached. You cannot preach the gospel without preaching the word. You're going to preach the word, that word's got to be incorruptible. Now, let me remind you of what our good friend, uh, Dr. Daniel Wallace, Dallas Theological Seminary, said about the words that are in your Bible. He said, in all particulars, only the original Greek and Hebrew text can be regarded as the word of God. Something is always lost in translation. Always. Well, that's not what they thought at Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, they were hearing the Word of God translated into the tongue that they all spoke. They said, we do all hear in the tongue wherein we were born 
the, uh, the works of God. They were hearing the translated word of God. And who was translating that word? The Holy Ghost was. He was giving them that gift of, of the interpretation of tongues. And then he said this. And I'm just going, what an idiot. He said, scholars are not sure the exact words of Jesus. Now, that part I do believe. I do believe that there are a lot of scholars who are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. I, however, am not one of them. Amen. I don't have a problem. When I, read what the, when I read Jesus wept, I believe Jesus wept. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, I believe that he said, Lazarus, come forth. Scholars are not sure the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth... Though red letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. Liar. Amen. Peter said, in fact, I'll, let's read it. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look in your Bible. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Who was it that reminded Matthew of all the words that Jesus spoke? Who was it that, that brought those back to his mind? It was the Holy Ghost. Who was it that told Luke the very words that Jesus spoke, even though Luke may not have been there to hear those words? It was the Holy Ghost of God. Who was it that directed Matthew and Mark and Luke to write gospel accounts that are very similar to one another? And yet, who was it that directed John to write something different than the other three had written? That, was, that would have been the Holy Ghost. Okay? The Holy Ghost did that. So here's this guy now. This man trains thousands of young men to go out into the pulpits of this country. Think of what's being lied about in the pulpits of this country, in Southern Baptist churches, other types of churches all over the country, maybe even all over the world. These young, these young men are going to these seminaries. They're hearing junk like this. They're repeating that from their pulpits. They're trying to tell people, you can't believe the Bible. What are you, nuts? We're the kind of church that doesn't believe every word in the Bible's true. I, don't, I just don't understand that. Amen? So let's do this. Okay? Let's do this. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Let me tell you where God's heart is. Where God's mind is. How God thinks. How God sees certain issues. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 35. I want you to open your Bibles up. Even though I have it on the screen, I want you to open your Bibles up. And I want you to you kind of underline this passage. And just kind of keep it in your mind. When God gave the Israelites the law, He did not just give them the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. He did not just give them that. He gave them civil laws. He gave them ceremonial laws. He gave them ritual laws. He gave them laws of sacrifice, laws of tithing, and laws of this and laws of that. But God also gave them civil laws. This was God ruling over his people through the written law. And there was no king at this time. There was no uh, congress or anything like that. The law had already been established. All there was in Israel for government were judges. Moses was one of those judges. He was the chief judge. Then below him, there were the, the rulers over thousands, rulers over hundreds. And down each tribe, you would have a, an elder in each tribe who was uh, over, let's say you would have one man who was over the whole tribe of Judah. And then down below him, you would have the elders over the various clans in Judah. And then it got on down to the different districts and then on down to the different neighborhoods. You know, people, when they'd camp, they liked to camp by people they're familiar with. 
And so there would be like little judicial districts and so on, and there would be an elder who would be over those people who would judge on matters of the law. Let's say that, uh, let's say that one guy over here uh, bought a, a, a calf from, from one of his neighbors over here, and the man misrepresented this issue on the calf. Well, they would bring it before their judge, and they would ask the judge. they say, you know, this guy sold me a calf that's no good, and I want my money back. And this judge would judge according to the law, according to what God had given him. He would judge based upon equity. If a guy paid a, a, a thousand shekels for a calf that wasn't worth 50 shekels, then this guy is going to have to give the calf back, and he should get his thousand shekels back. Now everybody's whole. Everybody's equal. Everybody is as if as just how they started out. Does that make sense to everybody? See, that's how the law is supposed to work. Everybody's supposed to be equal, all right? And though, so that's how they did it. They didn't have a king who just arbitrarily made it up as he went. Well, I like this guy, so I think I'll give him. You know, he's related to my second cousin, so I think I'll, I'll let him get something that this other guy's not going to get. No, 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 it wasn't like that. It was done according to the law of God, the word of God. By the way, you're going to be judged by this book. Amen. You go stand before God, God's going to read this book and say, okay, you did this and this and this and this and this and this. What do you think I ought to do to you? Well, according to God's law, you're guilty. You should burn in hell for all eternity. But you've got the blood applied. Amen? Now watch this. Leviticus 19. God even had civil laws concerning scales. Scales. I've got a scale at my house. I get on it every morning. Same time every morning. Same conditions every morning. I get on it and I weigh myself. And without fail, that same day I'll go to the doctor and it's 15 pounds more than... And I'm going, uh, doctor, your scale's not right. I'm just telling you right now, that's not right. That's not what I saw this morning. So Leviticus 19, verse 35. God said, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. In, what's that next word? Meat yard. Meat yard. See the word meat? That is meter, metrics, measurement. We all know what a yard is, right? You should do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, which is measuring distance, in weight, or in measure. Just balances, because who designed gravity? God did. God designed gravity. God made sure that everybody on the planet is under the same gravity. Amen? If you weigh 200 pounds in America, well, lo and behold, if you go to the other side of the world, you're going to weigh that exact same amount of weight. Gravity is the same the world over. It's no different anywhere. Just balances, just weights. A just ephah and a just hen shall you have. I am the Lord your God. Notice that he put his name to it. If you're going to have a set of scales, you better make sure those scales are right. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. Now how many of y'all think God's right in this? Say amen. So I don't want to hear this, well, that's under the law. We don't have to do that anymore. Don't give me that nonsense. Amen? These are rules. This is how God thinks. This is how God is. And I preached on this here a while back where there's a lot of people who want God to have an unjust balance because they want God to weigh their good deeds against their bad deeds. Oh, I think I'll come out all right. I've got more good deeds than I've got bad deeds. Well, according to Ezekiel 33, you don't have any good deeds left. You squandered them all when, you're, when you committed that bad deed. You, God, wiped them, God took them off the scales and said, there you are. Amen? So now watch this. Take a look up on the screen. What you see up there is a representation of scales, measurements, Weights and standards. Okay? 
Look at that. There's Up there is a tape measure. If you buy a tape measure in America, even if it's made in China, they should all be exactly the same. What happens if you've got two carpenters working on the same wall and their tape measures are different? You're going to have a house that you'll have to be like this. What happens... <laughs> what happens to people like me when your bubble's in the middle? Amen? Okay? I mean, look, at the, look how simple that... See that bubble there? See how simple that is? That's gravity, is all that is. Gravity is a constant. It doesn't change from one day to the next. It's just like the sun rising and setting. It goes up and it comes down, and gravity is the same. And if the bubble's in the middle, that means it's level. And if the bubble's not, that means it's not level. You need to work on it some more. So it's level. Um, I got up there. Sterling and I used to work in drywall. And when you ordered a sheet of drywall, it would come in 8-foot lengths or maybe 12-foot lengths or something like that. But every single one of them was exactly 48 inches wide. I mean exactly 48 inches wide. It had to be that way. Because when the carpenters framed the wall to that house. It had to be framed so that two sheets of drywall would go up against that wall. We didn't ever stand drywall up. Okay, we never do that in residential housing. They do it in some commercial work, but not residential. Residential, they lay that, they put that first sheet up across the top, and that second sheet across the bottom, and if those stupid carpenters didn't do, didn't do their job right, then that drywall's not going to fit on that wall, or there's going to be a gap down there bigger than what should be. So the carpenters that buy the, the lumber that goes in the stud cavities of that wall, they do not buy an 8-foot, 2x4 board to go in there. It is not The wall is 8 foot. But the studs that go in there... Because there's a, there's a header across the top and a footer across the bottom, then that stud that goes in there has to be, what is it, 92 and 5 eighths inches exactly. And the lumber yards, whether you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or the Do It Center or what's this other place? Hoods. Doesn't matter where you go, if you order pre cuts to go in a wall, every single one of them is going to be 92 and 5 eighths inches exactly. So if you go in any store in Jefferson County and say, yeah, yeah, I need 100 pre-cuts, they know exactly what you're talking about, and they give you the exact same board. Why? That's because the drywall is 48 inches and 48 inches, and it has to fit in that exact spot. Okay? And if you don't, it throws the whole thing off. Now, can that be overcome if it's not done that way? Yes, it can. You can cut the drywall. Drywall hangers don't like it because they get paid by the foot. When they hang more drywall, they get paid more money. That's how they're supposed to work, but I never knew drywall hangers that work too fast. I can tell you that. Okay? But it can be overcome. But just as a standard, this is how it's accepted all over this country. Are you with me? Okay? And we're just talking about a sheet of drywall. And a sheet of drywall in this country has a standard specification all over this land. Everybody accepts the same standard everywhere. You follow me? Fidget spinners. Who's got a fidget spinner? Is there a fidget spinner in this room right now? No? Nobody's got one? I was counting on somebody having a fidget spinner because I was going to spin it for you. Fidget spinners are amazing because you just take that thing and you flip it and hold it and it'll spin for a long, long, long time. Why? It's because whoever designed the ball bearings to go in that thing designed every one of those ball bearings to be exactly the same size. That's how can they spin so well. If one of those ball bearings is too small, or slightly, and I mean a hairbreadth too big, 
What happens to the fidget spinner? It won't spin. Or let's say the fidget spinner's got three little wings on it, I guess they call it. What happens if one of those wings weighs a little bit more than the other two wings does? It's going to look like every ceiling fan in your house. Blah, 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 blah. It's doing this, right? <laughs> wires. Copper wires. They all have standards. Do you know why? Copper wires have to have standards to them or your house will burn down. Copper wires are made to only take so much electrical current through it. And what happens, Wayne, if a copper wire is, has more electrical current going through it than what it was designed to carry? What happens? And? And? That's what I wanted you to say, Wayne. It's going to burn the house down. And we're just talking about headphones. Right? Wires that carry information to your television, your computer. Who thinks that there ought to be a standard for what a gallon is? Do you think that it's possible that a gas station can cheat? Sure it is. This is why a guy from the government who has a certified machine goes to gas stations, pours out a gallon of gas into his little machine... And his machine determines whether or not it's really a gallon or not. Because if their machine pours out less than a gallon, and you paid for a gallon of gas, that means they're making more money unjustly. What would you do if you found that your gas station was cheating you on gas? I'd holler about it. Number one, I'd quit going. Number two, I'd holler about it. I want to see that guy from the government put that sticker on that pup. Saying that that's right. Did you know that somewhere in the United States of America, in the Division of Weights and Measures, they have these little deals that they're holding in a secure room, in a vacuum-sealed case, so that not even human dust particles can get on it to throw it off. There are the exact weights and measures stored in our government so that we have a standard. Right? Doctors delivering medications to you. Is it important that those lines on that needle, is it important that those lines are accurate? Why is that important, Heather? You're either going to not get the medicine you need and you could die, or you're going to get too much of the medicine you need and you're going to die. There's a standard everywhere. Cop holding a radar gun. Old Eldon, you remember Eldon, the blind man. He used, to be a, he used to be a sheriff, a county sheriff. And he had a guy who used to sit there with that radar gun and shoot radar at people and pull them over for speeding. And a guy argued with him one time. Eldon said, I caught you doing like 75 and a 60 here. And the guy said, I wasn't doing 75. He said, I wasn't doing no more than 70. And he said, well, that's what I shot you at. And he said, well, I'm telling you, he said, my speedometer is right. He said, but mine's certified. <laughs> so if you want to go to court, I'll bring the certification in on my gun because mine's been tested and yours hasn't. And I don't know about these, you know, they put them little radar deals on the side of the road to show you how much over the speed limit you're going, Okay. When I look down at my speedometer, my speedometer is always off from what they're saying on there. So I don't know if mine's right or not. But it tells me that I can go at least five more miles an hour before I can really get in trouble. Okay? See that guy with that block wall there? What's that little device he's got in front of that wall? Gravity. God designed gravity and gravity's the same everywhere. Everybody in this world is under a standard of weight called gravity. You know why? Because God treats everybody exactly the same. Does God save Sterling in a different way than he saves Ryan? 
Let's say at the end of Sterling's life, he's got 10,828 sins to his account. At the end of Ryan's life, Ryan lived 30 years shorter than Sterling. Ryan's got 800,947 <laughs> sins to his account. Okay? And he was working on that last one, and he lost his breath and died. Is it the same grace? Same grace, same blood, same mercy, same salvation. There are people who sin more than others. But it only takes one. Amen? Amen. Amen. And God covers it all. So now take your Bible and turn to Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. So here, here's, here's what I'm getting at. While you're turning to Amos 7. There are standards for drywall, standards for pre-cut studs, standards for tape measures, standards for copper wire, standards for kids' toys. Ball bearings in a child's toy, there are standards for that. Standards for needles, standards for gallons of gasoline, standards for weights, balances, standards for scales, standards for speedometers, standards for what really is considered to be straight and level and balanced. Why is an unbalanced wall dangerous? Over time, gravity pulls. Okay? So if a guy's, if they're building a 100-story building, and at the bottom it starts out plumb, but they're off by one one-thousandth of a degree. Over a hundred stories, what does that do to that building? That building's going to fall. That building's going to fall. I used to watch bricklayers. We used to know some guys. We were good friends with them. Old Gene and his dad, Kurt. And they were always fun to watch, but they leveled and they plumbed every single row of bricks. Had to be. Or over time, it would be a disaster. Are you there? Say amen. There's standards and rules and guidelines for every issue in life, including some of the most trivial things, such as a fidget spinner. I mean, you can buy them for what, five bucks now? But why would you pay five bucks for a fidget spinner when the ball bearings are not right on there, when you could pay five bucks for one where they were perfect? You wouldn't buy the one that was bad. It's no good, okay? There's standards for everything, and everything is precise and perfect with the exception of man's salvation. And going from church to church to church, you start asking these people, does the Bible have to be 100% right? Nine times out of ten, they will tell you, well, we know the Bible's not 100% perfect. No, that's not what I know. What I know is the Bible has to be... See, we're not talking about a fidget spinner. We're not talking about a, uh, an electrical cord. We're not talking about a needle. We're not talking about a radar, and we're not talking about a gallon of gas. We're talking about whether someone hits the mark or misses the mark. We're talking about whether someone spends eternity in heaven or hell. What way is it that leads to life eternal? Straight is the way. Now, what is God's definition of straight? Perfectly straight. Broad is the way that leadeth to what? That's the way I build things. It is. I'm awful at it. I do not build stuff. 
Because I look at a tape measure and it says 36 and 7 eighths inches. I'm going 35. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. I don't build stuff. I let him build it. Okay? God says it's straight. Do you think God means it's absolutely 100% straight? So in Amos chapter 7, verse 7, he said, Thus he showed me, and he, behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. When God set the plumb line amongst his people, what do you think he saw? Crooked people. But you know what we do? We don't measure ourselves against God's plumb line. We measure ourselves against other crooked people. And we justify ourselves by how crooked they are. And we say to ourselves, well, I'm not like them because they're way off. I'm only half off. And that's what we do. And, so, and, we, and this issue of salvation, the same thing. God said that being born again comes from incorruptible seed. He said it comes from a straight line. It comes from a plumb line that he sets in the midst. We don't measure whether we're saved by what everybody else is doing. We measure ourselves against God's word. And if God's word says we're off, then we're off. Okay? Whether we can handle it or not, we're off. But if God's word says, I've washed away your sins, and I've washed you clean and pure. Now you are pure. God's version of pure is better than anybody else's version of pure that I know. Okay? So he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So in Isaiah 28, 17, is what he said. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. How's God going to measure you? By your standard? No, by his. By his standard. Let's, let's take this down and go to like uh, Deuteronomy 18. You'll have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 18, God gives the standard for whether or not you have to listen to a prophet. Guy rises up and says, I'm a prophet of God. Okay, prove it. So he prophesies. He prophesies 20 times, and all 20 times, what he says happens, happens. The 21st time, he's off a little. Do you have to listen to him? No, because God's standard said if he's wrong one time, you don't listen to him. That's God's standard. God has a high standard of what's true, what's perfect, what's just, what's straight, what's level, what's plumb. God has a God told Israel, I do not want to see an unjust balance in my people. It's an abomination. I do not want to see it. You want to measure yourself? You measure it my way. And here's what we do. In, in all the churches and in a lot of people's minds, they measure themselves the way maybe their church tells them to measure or they measure themselves maybe the way their own measurement is. But very seldom do we ever measure ourselves against God's standard. And God's standard is always true. It's always right. It's always straight. It's always plumb. God's always level. Amen? Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and water shall overflow the hiding place. Water shall overflow the hiding place. What's going on in Houston, Texas right now? You know what, you know what happens after every storm? God always exposes who built the houses well and who didn't, doesn't he? Because some houses just seem to survive the storms pretty well. That's because the walls were straight and plumb. The foundation, true. And that house didn't have the gravity issues that other houses do. And that's why they fell and the other houses stayed up. That's how God measures it. So in Deuteronomy 25, listen to this. Listen to what God said. Okay? I'm going to run through this very quick. Deuteronomy 25, 13. Thou shalt not have in thy bag divers weights, great and a small. 
In other words, you're sitting at the marketplace and a friend of yours comes up, you're going to give him a discount. So you cheat the scales a little bit. And then somebody else comes along and you don't like them, so you reach in your bag and you have a different weight for this guy than you do everybody else. Do we think that's right? When judges let some people off for crimes, when O.J. Gets, gets away with murder, do we think that's right? When some people get away with crimes and other people don't, is that right? No, it's not right. It's wicked. And God said it was. Thou shalt not have in thine house divers measures, a great and a small, but thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. Then why can't we have a perfect Bible? Why would we have to settle for a Bible that's not perfect? A perfect and a just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination of the Lord thy God. Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is abomination of the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 16, I like 16.11 verses. Amen. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Do you see that? Why is it that God is so concerned with how much something weighs? Because it has everything to do with sin and righteousness. Proverbs 20, verse 23. Divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. Would it, would it have been okay for Jesus to have just one tiny little sin? Not according to God's law. It would not have been okay. He could not have sinned even one little time. Not once. And people try to tell me that my Bible has an error in it. I don't believe it. Not allowed to. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. The last thing I want to share with you tonight, watch this, Judges 17, 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A yardstick is exactly 36 inches long in all 50 states. A yardstick is exactly 36 inches long. And just in case there is a standard somewhere in the government where they have measured out an exact inch. Your clocks on your computers, normally Windows now sets this up automatically that it adjusts the time on your computer to match the atomic clock because there is even a standard for what time it is. Do you know back in the Revolutionary War there was no standard. One guy could say it's a quarter till three, another guy says no, it's 4.30. Okay? There is no standard. Okay? Everything has a standard. Imagine a world that we lived in where no McDonald's restaurant was exactly the same. McDonald's is notorious for being exactly the same everywhere. Imagine a world where you went to McDonald's and all, all the stuff that you were used to at your McDonald's, they didn't have it at that McDonald's. They had a bunch of other stuff. California stuff in a Missouri McDonald's. How crazy is that? Imagine a world where everybody gets to do what's right in their own eyes. No. There's standards for everything. Why can't there be, amongst the churches of God, a standard for everlasting salvation. I say there is. And I say it's the word of God. Okay? And now we may argue about... Well, give me something we can argue about that has to do with distance. We may argue about how far Ryan can jump versus how far I can jump. Ryan says, I can jump three feet, flat-footed. Yeah? Well, I can jump four feet. All right? 
Now, we can argue about that stuff all day long. But we would not ever disagree as to how far three feet is. Right? No, we wouldn't. And there are things between us all in this room that we would look in the Bible and say, well, I kind of see it like this, and you kind of see it like that, and I can handle that. But as far as I know, there ain't a one of us that says, well, I've found that in verse 35 of chapter 12, according to the original Hebrew, the King James is wrong there. So that's what the cults do. When they find verses in the Bible that don't match their doctrine, they just change the verse or take it out. But we don't do that. We don't argue about what a foot is. We don't argue about what the Bible says. If the Bible says it, that's what it says. And there's no way around it. Amen? Amen. That's what our salvation is based upon, incorruptible seed. And if the seed's got corruption in it, I don't want it. I don't want it. Because if the seed is corruptible, the salvation is corruptible. And I don't believe it. Let's stand to our feet. If the fidget spinner don't spin, it ain't right. Amen? And if the fidget spinner was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Amen? <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, you gave us laws and standards on what seems to be some of the most trivial things in the whole Bible. What a a hen, a flower was. And God, you declared that those measurements had to be 100% perfect and accurate. And nobody was to have different scales and different measurements and different weights. And God, I thank you that you are not a God that looks at some men different than others. You're no respect of persons. And God, that you see that when a person sins one time or a person sins a hundred times, they both sin. You see them the same. And the blood of Calvary then is applied to the sin, and it saves the sinner. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, some of your people just don't seem to struggle with certain issues, and some do. And yet, God, you provided a salvation and a standard for all of them. And I thank you for that. Father, you gave us math. You gave us numbers and metrics, fractions. You gave us an amazing world of math that's always right. And when we apply that, Lord, to certain standards, this world just runs smoothly. And Father, when we apply that standard to your word, we see that your version of pure means that there can be no error, no mistake, no corruption, not even in the smallest way. Father, thank you for teaching us this. Instill it in our hearts. Help us, Father, to see people the way you see them and not judge people in our lives unjustly. Father, help us, dear God, to have a good weight and a good measure, a good line, and help us, dear God, to judge ourselves according to your word and not according to one another. Father, forgive us of our sins and help your people. And thank you for this incorruptible book. We love you and we love it. And we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. God bless you.